If I walk into a meeting with a prospective client and I'm already thinking like, okay, I'm going to get a second meeting. I'm going to get him as a client. There's nothing wrong with that, but it limits what's possible because the only thing I'll hear them say in the meeting is whatever I need to hear them say to get the second meeting and make, get them a client. The only questions I'll think to ask is whatever questions I need to ask to get them. So I'm like, I'm actually being run by this agenda and this outcome I've already predetermined. But if I walk in with like, I have no place to get other than to serve this person. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm totally free to hear what they're saying. I even hear what they're not saying. I have, I think of inspired things to say to them and questions to ask that they're blown away by. And then the score just takes care of itself. All right. This is Garrett Gunderson and I've got Chris Smith with me, um, which Chris is someone that has absolutely changed how I operate with my family and was in the financial business back in the day and is kind of in the financial business again, but more in a way that he's helping people in that business to better tell their story. And as I met him, I hired him to help me do my origin story that went within this like video book called The Wealth Book. So like I've written seven books, but that's the only book that comes with a video monitor. And we went to my hometown of East Carbon, Utah. He got to see this place I was raised that had 5,000 people at its heyday and was down to 1,000 people. And when it had 5,000, I had two cops. And with 1,000, it has five cops. So it just shows it's definitely going <laughs> in the wrong direction. Um, I also got to meet uh, his wife where I found she has the most unique system of hiding things. So if anyone ever tried to rob their house, they would never find anything because only she could imagine the system and what she's doing. So, so dude, that was like so entertaining. That was awesome. That. <laughs> where are you at today? Are you in uh, Arizona or Hawaii? I don't ever know where you're living. Yeah, no, we're, we're in Arizona right now. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great to see you when you came out to Tempe and hung out with me. Um, yeah, that was awesome, man. The worst stop of my tour, man. I had, I had a rough night that night. It wasn't my best material, but uh, it was great to, to have you there, you know? Well, hey, I thought it was great. So if that was your worst night, then things are things are good. All right, good, good. Well, when we were hanging out in Park City, you took me and my wife through this exercise of like, we're just having lunch, but you're talking about a lot of people, they don't share their tough stories with their kids. And so it actually diminishes the resilience that people have because it's like shielded from them and like when you share stories like talk about that process how you discovered that what you do with that and and by the way this you know this episode really is like how can people have a great family and a business because a lot of people do what i call getting scaled they scale their business at the expense of everything else in their life it just takes over everything totally yeah it's it's funny i, I I've, I've uh been te experimenting with these different posts right you know once a week on facebook I share a post that has something to do with business and family. And the one that's gotten the most, I would say, interaction or just was don't be so busy building a business, you forget to build your family. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's easy to do as, as, as an entrepreneur and it's easy for your family to get. Another thing is how do we make sure our family gets what's best of us, not what's left of us as an entrepreneur? Like we give everything to our business and then what's left over, it's like, hey, <laughs> hey, honey and kids, feast on these scraps of the leftovers, you know, that I've got yeah, what little I've got left. Life. Yeah. And I won't be present. I'll be thinking about the business. Like <laughs> yeah. that's the thing is it it's, it's hard. It's almost addictive to like grow a business and you see all these like results and you can measure things and you can watch it grow and it can make money and you know, all that kind of stuff. And it can feed the ego in doing that. And I just want to like, I want to challenge people because why does it matter? Yeah. Like I think that a lot of times we convince ourselves things matter more in the world than they actually matter. And what if we actually achieve that at the expense of our health or our family totally. or our quality of life? Well, I've said this before and I, I kind of call entrepreneurs out now when they say it and I hope they call me out when I say it. I've heard so many times and I've said before, I'm doing it for my family. And that's a lie. It's the biggest lie ever. Yeah. Man. Like like it, it, breaking bad, there's a moment where Walt says, I did it because I liked it. I did it because it made me <laughs> totally. feel good. And she was like, you, because the whole thing, he kept saying, I'm doing this for the family. But no, he wanted to build an empire. He wanted to feel good about building an empire, but it was using that scapegoat of the family. And I get it. Look, I, I, I can, from personal experience, I, I can see how it's so easy, so much easier to be intentional in your business and your family. Because look, in your business, dude, like you make money, you get recognized, you can measure things. You, you post something, you get feedback, people like you. Dude, most of us aren't coming home and our kids are like, dad, the way you work and sacrifice for our family is just inspiring. Thank you, mom. It's been great. Not that meal you've all. made, you know, three times today, was just delicious. And like, you just show up for us. It's just like, 
yeah, of course I'd gravitate towards something right. where there's an immediate ROI. I'm getting recognition. It's like, I don't know, like with these kids, hell, it may be 30, 40, 50 years before I know if there's an ROI, if there is one. Like, right. And they're like, hey, that was really cool. You did that for me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. like, oh good. It was worth it. So going back, later. going back to your original question, it's like, A, it is, it is easy. Like it, and that's why I think it requires this real intentionality of like, man, am I being as intentional or striving to be as intentional in building the brand, the culture, whatever of my home is in my business. But this research, some of the research came out of this article that my wife and I just absolutely love. It's a New York Times article called The Stories That Bind Us. And this, the, the person who wrote this article just provides a lot of really compelling research of how powerful family narratives are to children. And, and there's a ton in that article, but one of the things it talks about is there's three types of family narratives. There's the ascending family narrative, which basically is, hey, we came from nothing, we worked hard, now we have a lot. There's the descending family narrative, which is, hey, at one time we had a lot, and then your uncle, you know, ran off with the sheriff's wife and, you know, ruined the family forever or whatever, and now we are here. But then there's the oscillating family narrative, which is actually the most useful and is actually the most true, which is like, hey, like, yeah, we, we rise and we fall. But through it all, we, we bounce back. And we always bounce back stronger or we try to, or like, it's just, it's just a real narrative that like, Hey, we have highs, we have lows and we're going to share it because it creates in children, this, this identity around, man, I can overcome hard things and I can have success and I'll have challenges. And in that article, they also talk about research that I just think should be shared everywhere. That is really, um, really credible empirical research, but really largely unknown and that is that children who know about their ancestors and that could be that. a grandparent a great grand but but the more children know about their heritage and their ancestors the just the better they do in life in all categories like the more strength they have the more resilience they have the stronger sense of identity and so that also ties to this idea of our family narrative and, and basically the point garrett is like how much are we sharing with our kids about our past, like even just us as people. And what's crazy is you go to a lot of people like your parents, your grandparents, your aunt, your uncle, your great aunt, your great uncle, and you start asking them questions about family history. They, they have all this like gold locked up in them that they just don't share partly because they just don't think to. And secondly, we as a society have gotten out of the habit of being good family storytellers. Like, dude, back in the day, not that long ago. Because now, now we just get told stories by TV. Yeah. The only thing you had to do for entertainment not that long ago was sit around in the living room, light a candle, read the Bible, and tell stories. So it wasn't even seen as like an art or a, or a strength. It's just what you did. But we've really, we're really losing that as families. We are not passing on stories of who we've been, hard things we've overcome, great things we've accomplished. And our kids need to hear those stories because, man, those stories, that's why that article is called The Stories That Bind Us. Mm -hmm. Those stories give your children a sense of their identity. Like, wow, like, my, you mean my grandparents came on a boat and didn't know how to speak English or our language? And, and you don't even have to connect the dots. They connect them. They're like, that says something. That must say something about me. Like, that blood flows through my veins. It's like, yeah, it does. It's wild, man. Yeah, it is. It is wild. Like how much that like has to do with our identity, even for me, my own personal, like when I found out about my great, great, great grandfather, Christopher Layton, who I'm named after when I was at the lowest point in my life. And I started reading a story. I was like, dude, this guy started three towns, bought a boat, took it back to England, paid for the passage of like two. I'm like, and I'm talking about, I'm whining and complaining about starting a business. I was like, if that dude can do that, I can do more than I think I can, you know, and it was impactful this is, this, to me. Yeah, this is the tough thing today, man. Like entertainment, just like food, it's meant to be addictive. Like, so it's so easy to get trapped in a cycle of letting everyone else's fake story become our reality. Yeah. Like getting caught up in characters in a TV series or a movie that aren't real and watching that and it zoning out and then being entertained, but at the same time, not being educated, not growing in any way. And it's like, it's just like processed food. It has so many ways to like make our brains addicted to it. And so we're in a world where things are more convenient than ever and more destructive than ever through that convenience, right? Like, yeah, well, the analogy of the processed foods, the other thing that processed foods have an amazing ability to do that's almost magical is they also, help, they make you feel really full. 
and nourished when you're actually just like super empty. You know, and I think that's a lot of what you, you know, we think we're getting filled up by this stuff from the world and it's actually just depleting us. Yeah. And, and that's the, the, like, I'm sitting there thinking, even questioning my own life being like, okay, if I'm, if I'm working in the world of entertainment, doing comedy, like it better have a, like, cause we don't need just another like la laugh that means nothing. Right. Uh, that actually is an escape from life. Yeah. Like, yeah. But yeah, we could all use a laugh that actually has some meaning and some purpose and something behind it that actually might to, like ask a question we might not ask otherwise to have a realization that totally. might not come otherwise, you know, like, because like people aren't educated anymore. They're just indoctrinated. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. That, that's so true. It's like, everyone has a, everyone has a view, right? But it's like, but why do you have that view? It's like, well, I was fed we get, it. We get people that believe that view to reinforce it, right? So like telling stories of family that are up and down and all this is like, it shows uh, a different side of things when, you know, and most people are not feeling good, they'll just zone out to something. Like, I know, like if I'm exhausted, I just, it's easier to watch TV than have a conversation with my kids. Yeah, and I think what it really does is now that you say that, Garrett, is like all this noise and all this stuff that's coming at us, it's not, in my opinion, most of it, most of the time isn't the truth. And it sure as hell not our truth, but it's it's made to believe and be presented that way. But when you go read a story about your great aunt who became a self-taught midwife and delivered, you know, a hundred babies in her hometown. And like when, when a woman passed away, would take her kids in as her own. And like, that's truth. That's real. Right. That really yeah. happened. And that's really part of like who you are, you know? Yeah. And plus like how many more movies can we watch where people hit each other and don't hurt each other? Like, I'm just so <laughs> tired of this movie. Like, you know, I take my kids to some of those superhero movies. I'm like, yeah, cool. Like, why are we watching people that punch each other and it does nothing? It's right. Dumb. Yeah. <laughs> But it's all made to seem like, hey, that's reality. That's truth. And, and I think so right. much of this, like. Which makes us feel weaker. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. I think the hardest thing, to, in, in, in my opinion, in the world today with kids is like helping them get a sense of their true identity. Because I think so much of what's coming at us is meant to attack and confuse our identity all the way from our literal identity to even like an identity around like, how much do I matter? How much am I worth? Do I have a purpose? Our, Does my our life social have identity, our social clout, our you yeah. know, external validation, like there's more external validation now than ever before. And like identity, not that someone else gives us, but something that we know, like, you know, because even if you're really good at something and someone says, oh, you're the best at that, but it's not actually what you're very best at, when it doesn't go your way, you'll start to discount what they say and yourself because yeah. you're like yeah. adopting like so it's hard to let someone identify who they are because it's often rooted in an external factor that's not reality yep and that's and again that article it talks about like man one of the biggest factors in a child's identity and shaping their identity is how much they know about their family and it's just like it's just that's played out so much in my personal life I've seen it in my kids and so that's why it's we, 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 we feel called to talk about it a lot on our podcast and our program and just various things. And, you know, we talk about it a lot. Hey, I know I'm interrupting, but it's because if you go to garrettgunderson.com forward slash quiz, you can figure out your money persona. When you know your money persona, you'll be able to make better choices when it comes to your finances, understand where you've made mistakes and missteps and what was the psychology behind that, and really improve how you view money and how you work with other people with different money personas. So Garrett Gunderson, four slash quiz, no charge, discover your results, and go ahead and comment. Let us know what it was. So you're doing a lot in the financial space. What are you up to? Like yeah, man. Like it's it, it I'm having more fun than I've ever had, I think, in my career. And it's because you know, it's interesting going back to what you said is like, okay, so we take the world of entertainment and, and being a comedian, it, it, you know, in your vein, it's like, we probably don't just need another person, like another talking head that's just, just making people laugh. Well, when I look at the financial services industry, it's like, I don't think we need another licensed advisor who's just out there giving advice. Right. But what the industry really needs is it really needs a lot more leaders who are willing to provide leadership. So that's something I've been talking a lot about lately is <clears throat> advisors give advice and advice informs, but leaders provide leadership and leadership transforms. And if you think about what's going on in the world right now, with all the political, social, and economic uncertainty, I just believe people are starving for leadership now more than ever, especially in something around, you know, investments and wealth when like things are uncertain. It's like the last thing someone needs in a time of uncertainty around their, their financial situation is someone who's willing to give more advice. Like you can get advice right. anywhere. 
I was on a panel recently, and they were talking about, hey, there's it's all financial people, right? And I'm the I'm the least well read on this panel for sure because I just don't read a lot of what's going on in the economy because it's like I already know it's bad news. So like, cool. Yeah. And and the person next to me goes, well, I, I recommend three buckets, and bucket number one, it's like you just have something safe that beats inflation. And I'm I'm an asshole, so I go, well, what's beating inflation right now? Yeah, yeah. Please share, please share with I'm all like, of us. I'm like, but it's just the same narrative that's been going on for a long totally. time, right? And it's like, and again, it was like I could. I, there were very bright people on the panel, and one other one was probably more aligned with what I was thinking, and then the other two were just aligned with like what you would hear a mutual fund tell their people to tell everyone. Yeah. Right. And it's like. And that's not leadership. It's it may be effective for sales. It may be effective for totally. whatever. But the, the whole time I hear people saying, "Well, which in, which sector should I study? And which like where where would you invest money if you had this amount of money?" I'm like, those are all the wrong questions mm -hmm. because that has to do with something outside of your control and sphere of influence. And you're going to spend all this time researching something that you don't even care about or that doesn't matter to you just to make money. And you know how much money people would stop losing if they stopped investing in things that didn't add to their life, to their mental capital, to relationship capital. Like I had a, a friend here Saturday and he goes, hey man, there's this thing, um, it's a yield thing and it pays 6% per month, what do you think? It, and I said, you don't even have to describe any more of it, I can already tell you it's gonna fail. I'm like, run 6% a month for 10 years and it becomes such a huge number, it's silly, it looks like the government debt. I'm, I'm like, yet, if, why are you asking this question? You're a very bright person that has a lot to offer in the world with your business. Have you invested enough in that? Have you invested like, but, but yet we think that investments have to be outside of ourselves and it's seductive if it's totally, if it sounds good and it's marketed well and all that stuff is just garbage in my mind. It's just harming people, not helping them. Yeah. Then, and look, and there's lots of issues with the industry and there's lots of great things about the industry, but like, again, that's why I feel so called to like make a difference in the industry. And we do that by making a difference for, you know, individual advisors and firms, but it's just like, and one of the things we've done recently, which is really exciting is we've, uh, we've, we've licensed um, all of the research from what we feel is the best research company in the industry that does, you know, uh, qualitative and quantitative empirical research with affluent investors. And they've been doing it for 30 years and they're really amazing at it. And we felt it was the best research out there. So we licensed it. And then we're able to actually also influence the questions, right? And what's so crazy is like, this has always been the case, but even now more than ever in times of uncertainty, all of the latest research that we've done with these affluent investors, and we say affluent, a, a million dollars of investable assets and above. When you ask them what their most pressing concerns are, what they're looking for the most, in good investment advice, good investments, like good stock, don't even show up anywhere in the research. I'm not even saying it's at the bottom. It doesn't even like come up. What they're looking for is, I want to know that I'm going to be able to live like a fulfilling life. I want to know that I'm going to be able to do the things that I've always wanted to do. They're important to me. Um, I'd really love to work with an advisor who doesn't use any industry jargon or any, any industry speak with me. Like, it's like, so in another, what they're saying is I just want to be led. Like I'm looking for right. leadership. Like, I don't think most people, when they go to the first meeting with a financial advisor, which a lot of advisors call that a discovery meeting, I don't think they're showing up because they're like, man, I just hope I get some great advice today. They're, now they, but they what's interesting, they want to be seen. They yeah. Wanna... I don't even think they know what they want because they don't even know, they don't know that it's even possible to get leadership from the industry or work with a leader. But the minute you're just another advisor giving advice, the, the biggest risk in that to me is that the biggest risk in this industry to me as an advisor is being the same. Because the minute you're the same, the minute you're just another talking head, you're another advisor giving advice, you've commoditized yourself. And to be commoditized is, the, is to be anonymized. Like you might as well be invisible. I mean, you'll still get business, right? But if you actually like, no, I'm going to show up like a leader and I'm going to provide leadership and I'm going to be bold. And that's just, man, we, that message has been getting so much momentum lately. And then the ways we're actually teaching advisors how to show up like a leader and how to talk like a leader. Because I think the only thing you have as an advisor to stand out and differentiate yourself is two things. We, and it's leadership and language. So it's when I walk into the discovery meeting, do I show up? like a leader in the presence of a leader? And then do I have the language of leadership or do I just sound like every other advisor? And then it's so, I mean, this is just so true. You've seen this, like the times when leadership is needed the most in this industry is when it's the hardest to get a hold of your advisor. The times when leadership is needed the least is when they're always willing to answer the phone. It's like, I don't need you to answer the phone and get back Whatever to me when things are going right. great. But it's like, why do you go into hiding? And why is it so freaking hard to get a hold of you when I need you the most? So for the advisors that are awake 
and paying attention and willing to show up like leaders, I tell, I'm, I'm like trying to scream at them right now. Go, go. It's, it's, it's out there for the taking. There's more people than ever before who are open to a second opinion. There's more people who ever before aren't hearing from their advisor. If there was ever time to ratchet up your boldness, push all the chips into the table. Because I also think nothing, Garrett, it's kind of hard to differentiate yourself when things are going great. Because you're showing up and you're like, let me tell you how great I am. And they're like, well, our guy's doing pretty great too. It's like, it's in the times of uncertainty. It's the easiest to differentiate yourself, but it's weird. It's like, that's when most people pull back. It's when most people kind of go sit on the sidelines and like, let's just ride this out and let me see how this goes. It's like, no, go all in. So I have a, I have a event that I did uh, several months ago and a client that was there had just sold their business and were pretty much retired and put all their money in the stock market because that's what their advisor had them do. And the stock market was decreasing and his sleep was being decimated. And I don't, I don't really give financial advice. I'm, I mean, I do on efficiency. I do on philosophy. I don't like ever give stock market advice at all. I mean, I'm just not a stock market guy. So it's like, but I, but by the time I was done talking, he's like, I feel like I need to call my advisor and cash out. He's like, what do you think? I'm like, I think you know the answer and I can't give it to you. If I give you the answer, then you're putting your hand, your responsibility in my hands. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen a year from now. And I'm probably going to think more negatively about what's going to happen than what actually happened. So like, so anyway, so he calls the advisor to cash out and the advisor says, this is the dumbest idea that you've ever had and you'll be your biggest mistake of your life. And I was like, what an asshole. First off, only saying that because he's losing commission. Yeah. Like, yeah. and by the way, saved 600 grand so far. Well, that and, that, and that's a classic example of an advisor who's just giving advice. Like, right. it's like, that's not like a, that's not any. But it's, it's the moral hazard, Chris, of if someone's being paid based upon you staying in, it's very hard for them to give advice for you to ever go out. Yeah. Like that's a problem that's systematic in the industry that, you know, Hey, when you're not invested and not being paid, we have a problem because yeah. it's hard for the best of people with the greatest intentions to make that call to say, it'd be a good time to sit in cash. Instead what they say is over the long haul, the market goes up and the market goes, it's like all the regurgitated nonsense and not looking at the human being and saying, is this creating scarcity for you? Like, what are your downside protectors? Is this the only place that you should be ever allocating your money? Have right. you focused on cash flow? What is your lifestyle like? Like there's all these other factors where we have to look at the human being again, not at the outcome of the investment as the only factor. Totally. And it's like, well, going back to, we talked about identity earlier around kids. It's like, you know, the first, um, the first pillar in our methodology, when someone does go through our program on uh, for financial advisors, we call it uncover your identity. And hopefully we uncover an identity that's actually true enough and meaningful enough and purpose and purposeful enough that it rescues you, you, like it saves you from your own self and your own temptations to do things that are in your best interest versus, but if we have this identity that's bigger than us and we realize like, no, part of the work we're doing in this industry is we're, we're like, we're saving people. And that's another thing that I, you know, I feel like I'm trying to help the industry do a lot of times as advisors is wake them up to like the true power of what they're really doing. Cause it's, it's easy, you know, and from personal experience, it's easy in this industry to just kind of see like, well, what, what I'm doing is I'm selling insurance products or managing money in the market. It's like, no, no, no. That's like the, that's like the business model. What you're doing is way more profound and way more impactful right. um, how, than that. How much, how much confusion is around money? How much scarcity yeah. is around money? How personal is money i mean people people like i have a joke i'm like most people rather get naked physically than fiscally in front of everyone right? yeah like it's yeah. it's very vulnerable and for them to talk about these things especially if someone can ask that next question or peel the layer or get to like what is it that happened at childhood that has them feel this way and how no amount of money will be enough if they don't heal some of those things or you know what like for me understanding money personas so that the spouse isn't it odds? Like they can actually yeah. get on the same page and understand that those differences can be strengths when identified. They're only contention when they're not identified. They're only contention when they're neglected because the other person doesn't understand where they're coming from and know what that's about. Like, and I feel like going back to this thing with kids and then relating it, like I was thinking when I was given a webinar recently, I was like, hey, I'm gonna give the questions that my wife and I asked each other to understand our childhood and how we viewed money as kids and like understand why her 
money persona is a planner and mine's a creator and how the two can operate well together by being informed about different circumstances rather than the heat of the moment when the critical decision needs to be made. Right. Most people are making those decisions in the heat of the moment where the emotions are high and the intelligence is low, when the flame is high and the sight is low, right? And so because none of those conversations have happened, because it's all about asset allocation or dollar cost averaging or being in it for the long haul or you know diversified portfolios or rebalancing like none of that stuff matters to the individual that has emotions that are unresolved when they're unheard and when they're unheard that's going to create contention that puts them at odds with their advisors during times when it doesn't go according to plan and by the way no advisor is good enough to make it go according to plan for 30 years that's crap there's too much you know there's yeah. too much disruption there's too much change so it's simply like how how well do you see the person, hear the person, and help them to see themselves? Because in money, it's really hard to see ourselves. We have to like unmask it. Yeah, and to me, what you're, again, what you're describing that like that's leadership. That's what leaders do. Like, what, take take it even outside of this industry, right? Leaders help you. Like, leaders really hear you. They really see you. They help you see a bigger vision of what could be possible. They help you see yourselves. They help you get clear on what you think you actually want. Right? They're willing to challenge you and support you. Like, not just hear you and then say, well, here's my advice. And, and when, and one thing you said earlier, and I think that's really key is like, we got to bring the human being back into this industry and bring humanity right. back in this industry. And that's another thing that I, I always talk about within this vein of leadership is like, we've taken what is in my opinion, a incredibly human business. Like people are coming to you and sharing with you some of their biggest hopes and biggest dreams, biggest fears, biggest concerns, something that could impact their family for generations. And we've done a really good job as an industry of taking something incredibly human and making it very tactical and transactional Very transactional right. and stripped like the, and so if we can put some of that, like, like back into that and make the human being. And again, that's what the research is also showing. It's not like this is just my opinion or our idea. The research is actually showing that that's also what these, these, these individuals want. And that's the conversation they're actually interested yeah. in having and being in with an advisor is like, yeah, I think I want that. Like, and, and a lot of people don't even know it's possible to find that. And that's why I say, if you start showing up as a leader and talking like a leader and just, you'll, people will be like, wow, I've never talked with an advisor like you before. That's not how I rolled when I first got into the business. June of 98, I just studied and I was jargon heavy, which you said people didn't want. So I could sound smart, right? Yep. And I was regurgitating most of that. I mean, yeah, I was studying heavily, but like, you know, it was, it was, definitely the opposite of what was helpful it was right and, and the thing is i had objectives about the amount of money i wanted to make like so <laughs> i'm out there making my annual plan how many clients i want to have how much i want to make which really is a weird place when you think about it because it doesn't really consider them they end up becoming someone to fulfill what i want versus me adding value to what they want and and so this is a you know, it's a situation that might be confusing for a lot of people in the financial world, but it's like, if your goals are the number of clients and the amount of revenue that you personally have, you might not be able to see your client fully because you're too busy with your objectives instead of theirs. Yeah. And so like, that's, you know, that was, that was a hard reality for me to be like, oh, look, everything I'm talking about right now has to do with me and not them. And yeah, I was sounding really smart and I was getting them to do business with me because they felt... I guess I don't know, but this kid knows, so I'll give him the money. Yeah. And and that was a that was a problem. Well, I don't want to make yeah, because I don't want to make it sound like you can't be successful doing it the way you started doing it. You can be incredibly successful. I just got way more successful doing it differently. Yeah. Like it's, I, I got rid of my annual revenue goals. I got rid of my like number of client goals. Like I it, it, and I actually made more money. Because yeah. Because I, yeah. you know because we ended up creating an entire system called the producer revolution, realizing that if people didn't have the right mindset, the money didn't really matter. And that, you know, it was really about investing in that person and giving them forms that they would attend on a monthly basis and resources that they could learn from on a regular basis. And they really gravitated and it grew in a really massive way. And by the way, we got paid less on that $30 a month that they would write it, you know, that they would pay us for than we got paid by selling them a life insurance policy. Right. But the reality was the life insurance policy wasn't all that valuable if they didn't have a situation where that they understood their their money persona or where they understood like what they really wanted. And when I went in early on, I asked questions to get what I wanted, not asking questions for them to discover what they wanted. It was a it's a it's a I'm asking questions both ways, 
but one I'm listening and the other one I'm just going to the next question to get to an end result that made a commission for me. Yeah, it's, a, it's funny you talk about this because one of the things we train on a lot. Um, so with advisors, once we've helped them with their identity and their message, then it's like, okay, well, how do you deploy this? Like, like real time, like real life scenarios, like you're walking into a client discovery meeting, you're walking into a second meeting to show them the plan or whatever it is. Um, and so we have a narrative, right? That we teach them of, you know, how to weave the narrative through. But, but the most important part of our sales training is actually what happens before you even walk into the room. And we call it the mindset for enrollment. And we've even changed the terminology. It's not selling, it's enrolling. Because selling is often trying to convince and make it about you. Enrolling is trying to connect and make it about them. Like I'm here to enroll you into what you want, not what I want, right? We got to make it about them. Well, one of the parts of the mindset for enrollment, so the third part is we call it, we, have, we call it no place to get. Like, can you walk into a client discovery meeting with no place to get other than to serve them? No, no other agenda. They're like, they're like, I can't even have the intention of getting them, getting a second meeting. Nope. And they're like, so I'm I definitely can't have the intention of getting them as a client. Nope. And, 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 and it's not that those things are bad, but if I walk into a meeting with a prospective client and I'm already thinking like, okay, I'm going to get a second meeting. I'm going to get them as a client. There's nothing wrong with that, but it limits what's possible because the only thing I'll hear them say in the meeting is whatever I need to hear them say to get the second meeting and make, get them a client. The only questions I'll think to ask is whatever questions I need to ask to get them. As, so I'm like, I'm actually being run by this agenda and this outcome I've already predetermined. But if I walk in with like, I have no place to get other than to serve this person. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm totally free to hear what they're saying. I even hear what they're not saying. I have, I think of inspired things to say to them and questions to ask that they're blown away by. And then the score just takes care of itself. And I even tell them, this is some of the scripting language we, we teach advisors how to use at the very beginning of a client discovery meeting. Because look, how you start a, that first meeting matters. And how you start it, within about 10 seconds, they, they're either subconsciously putting you into the camp of, yep, another talking head, another talking advisor giving advice, or they're going to put you in a camp of something different here, right? Subconsciously. So imagine if I sit down with you, Garrett, and I'm like, hey, Garrett, glad to have you in today. So you bring your statements and uh, what brought you in today? I'm an advisor, right? Like any advisor can be like, hey, did you bring your statements with you today? And what brought you in today? But let's Let say we sit- you my awards and why I've been, yeah. how long I've been in business. <laughs> but let's say we sit down and go, hey, Garrett, really grateful to have you come in today. I really honor your time. As far as I'm concerned, today's meeting's all about you. And I just want you to know what my intention is for our time together today. My intention is to serve you and add value to you, whether we work together or not. And there's no pressure today. The only thing we're going to decide to get there today is if we have a second meeting. I have nothing to sell you. There's nothing for you to buy. And the promise I'll make to you is if I truly believe that I could help you, I'll tell you that. And I'll ask that we set up a second meeting. And if I don't think I'd be the best fit to help you, I will not waste any of your time. I'll tell you that, but I'll still provide any recommendations and resources that I think could be valuable to you. How does that sound? And people are just like, sounds great. Like you just like, you know, but, but again, they've never been spoken to that way by an advisor and you're just telling them like, look, I'm here. I don't know if we're going to work together. Like, how could I even, and if you actually think it's pretty stinking presumptuous to actually even think that you already know that you're going to get a second opinion or second meeting, or you're going to work, you know, nothing about these people. So you might as well just go in free, not attached to any agenda, any outcome. And what was crazy is I had a mentor who taught me this concept when he challenged me with no place to get, it was really hard for me. Cause I love, I love getting places. I love like, Oh, I got, I got the sale or I got the second meeting or but when I started practicing no place to get, I never got places faster, farther. So by having no place to get, I got there way faster and way farther anyways. Kind of like you when you said, well, and I changed my goal and I made it about them. I actually had more success. I also think the thing you, that we underestimate sometimes, if you're a founder, meaning you have a team and you're hoping to scale up that team and have other advisors someday, everything you do is driving the culture directly or indirectly. So like if you're like a really tactical, set your goals around numbers and, and revenue, and then the client is just a means to get there, you're building that into the culture of your organization. It has a bigger culture, cultural ripple effect than, than you think it does, you know, but. So what's this hat that you have on? What is that? Oh, it's just a brand that I, I, I have like 10 of their hats. Hats don't fit me well, and I have to try on a ton of them. It's the only hats I've ever bought online that like, it fit. And so now I just buy, it's called Burley Bow. 
the name of the company. You'd like their you'd like their gear and their brand. They're cool. Uh, they have like uh, lots of different you know outdoor gear and outdoor clothing. So it's just head of, set of deer antlers on a hat. So is, it, so is it for hunters mainly? It like, is a little bit. Yeah, it's a hunting, fly so fishing. You hunt or you just uh, like you like to pose that you hunt? But tell me which one it is, Chris. I'm definitely a, a, a hunt occasionally more pose that I hunt. Um, I fly fish more than I hunt. And so they have some cool fly fishing hats too. Um, yeah, you'd love their gear actually. I sh- I, I, now that I'm thinking about I'm it, I'm a very rookie fly fisherman. I mean, I've got, I've got, oh, like me a too. River on my cabin and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm a, a Ron who, you know, he's really good. Like I, yeah. I, I, I can do a couple things and that's and, amazing. You know, that's it. I did. Uh, my I did wife once came out while I was fly fishing and was like, you're out here by yourself. You're going to drown. I'm like, if I drown in this small amount of water, it was time. It was I deserve to. to go. It was my I time to drown. And I was just proud of myself because I was out there by myself and I netted fish on my own, you know, and uh, that's and incredible. That was a good thing. And uh, yeah, Dude, I, here's I, what I, here's I, what I've learned. My five fishing style is because like, so I have a client who is a financial advisor who got me and my boys to start coming fly fishing um, just on this little creek in northern Arizona. And but they stock it and pretty big, you know, trout. And so it's fun. They put up a fight and like it's a good way to learn. I'd only been doing that a few months and he goes, Hey, one of our guys fell out for our, uh, big, our annual fly fishing trip this year. We're going to this, uh, Iggy Agig, um, Alaska on the Quijack river that flows into the Bering Strait. He goes, we have a spot open. And I'm like, he goes, you know, enough, like come. So I go, didn't, I mean, I don't deserve to do that trip. Right. I'm like, I'm not like seasoned enough dude. It was the most incredible. And so then we all made an agreement with each other that we would just do one of those every year in a different location. Nice. And so this, so COVID obviously, you know, screwed up our, uh, our plans for a little bit, but we, uh, we've all paid and next summer we're going down to the Amazon and going to, fl- uh, f- uh, fly fish for peacock striped bass. It looks amazing. So I'm more of that, like, even that, like, I'm not a true fly fisherman. I'm the guy who knows enough how to cast and I like, can like I just take, go like, on the, take my kids, all I do is tie flies the whole time. Like I'm just tying the line. Seriously. You know, cause like, cause like to to go with a fly rod and then tie the two line together. I slow with that. Yep. I'm okay at putting the hook on, right? Yeah. Depending am I doing like a bouncer? Like it just, t- like my son's like, you haven't really fished today. I'm like, that's cause I'm, by the time you guys lose a fish or catch a fish and this gets tangled up or whatever, it's like, I'm just tying one of your other Dude, my, lines the whole time. My buddy called me out. He's like, when are you going to take the time to learn how to tie flies, tie lines together, tie your leader, tie. And I was like, well, the minute I start learning it, you stop doing it for all my kids. Cause like we would just go out and he knew I didn't know how. So he just like, that's going to be a lot of work. Now, (laughs) like I, my wife and I took three, like tie our own fly classes. Well, she took four. I couldn't make one of them, but mine always looks so terrible, but they crushed dude. Because I think they're just like, Oh, there's a, there's a fly that's injured. I can get that one. The easiest. There's a maimed fly. That's not going to make it. Like he's he's not getting away. Defect. It's yeah. But like they do, there might be some, there might be some brilliance to that, dude. That's a, that's a new, that's a new business model. Tying flies that suck that look like maimed, uh, maimed injured flies. So, and then we have a pond and this pond has massive fish in it. And like, you can go out and the first few casts, you can get them. And then the whole pond knows like, no, that's not real. And yeah. then no, and then there's no bites. The rest not of the happening. Time. It's crazy. That's yeah, It's hard to use fly. You can't really fly fish that. Cause they'll just tear the line up. They're just big, big, rainbows, yeah. you know? So yeah. No, it is amazing, man. And I, here's, here's one of the things I do love about fly fishing though. And I would guess like people who are really avid hunters would say this is like, it forces presence. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, and there's, there's not a lot of things that as much as bow hunting, bow hunting is yeah, like next level that way, but like fly fishing, you know, like, unless you're doing like, but like, like Aaron's doing like bone fish, like in the, in the ocean, like that's right. hunting more right. than it's fishing. Right. Like it's super hard, but you like, and for those who've never fly fished, it's not like you got some big old bobber out there and a bass is hitting it. And you could feel it. You don't, you usually don't feel it. You see, and you got like a split second to react. Yep. You gotta react and set your fly or nothing and so i just love that like me and my kids can go out there there's no devices no phones most of the places you're at don't have cell reception and you and and you because if you think about the world we live in today there's not a lot of things that force you to be present you know it's the same when i rodeo a little bit and you know i garrett knows this but i grew up in a ranching rodeo family and i still team rope quite a bit but i make it a point to just not bring my phone with me because i could and i still have but i just love that forced presence of my phone's in the truck i'm out here on a horse i'm outside 
I just don't think enough people are doing that, man. Like I think most people, myself included, you can look up and be like, dude, I've been tethered to this freaking device, except for when I'm asleep. I'm tethered to this thing 24. It's, it's just it, not good it, for it, us. It's because it's genius level addiction, man. It's like, they're just so totally smart at getting you to want to utilize it. Can, so I would say, look for some activities where you can kind of like trick yourself into like forcing yourself to be present where you. So have you bow hunted then? Have you ever no, I, dude, that'd be, see, here's the problem though, Garrett. Probably like you, I have a ridiculously addictive and competitive personality. So I can't like dabble in things. Like someone asked me the other day, they're like, why do you buy such nice horses? Or, and I, and I told him, I said, look, if I golfed, I would have the nicest clubs money could buy. And I would have the, the best lessons. Cause, cause my mind my mentality is like, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Yep. Like if I'm going to rodeo, I am going to have. Yeah, the I, nicest I retired horses. from golf because I was never going to dedicate the time it took to be great. So, so I, the other thing is like, if, if, if there's an activity that I don't feel like I could be intentional enough, to be great at it, it, the pain of not being great is greater than just, you know what I mean? I would just rather stop doing it all together. I found things that were easy to be great at. Like I, I would never want to be great at wine because there's people that are like next level. But I'm like, there's not as many people great with whiskey. So I became a whiskey sommelier. It's just an easier, and I can taste the different things so much easier. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's and by, not as douchey as a wine sommelier, but it's pretty close. Uh, and I'm not... You know, and I, and I hope that doesn't mean I'm trying to say like everything I try, I'm great at, but I, I have to believe that I could become really good at it. And I could, and so like something like bow hunting, dude, it's called to me a few times, but it's like, could I, can I find bandwidth amongst my businesses, my five kids, the fact that I already rodeo, I have a couple hobbies, their stuff, you know, it's like, cause I know that if I, if I was to get into it, I couldn't just, my, and my wife asked me that all the time why can't you just be like some other people who can just like dabble in things and have a hobby that they do once a quarter or once. And I'm like, I don't know. I can't, I just. Well, that's good, man. That's yeah. Good. What are you most excited about right now? What are you most excited about? Definitely. I would say that what I'm most excited about right now is definitely the momentum that we're hitting and experiencing in financial services. There's just some really cool opportunities at the individual firm and advisor level, but also in corporate, there's just some really incredible things that are happening. And, you know, the partnering with this research company and just like, there's a lot of momentum there. And I feel like we're, we can really make a difference, not just be successful. I feel like we can really make a difference in that industry. Another thing I'm really excited about is my wife and I just hit the hundredth. Uh, we just recorded our hundredth episode of our family brand podcast. That was a big milestone. Like to her credit, I mean, it's all hundred percent her. We haven't missed a weekly episode since we launched it two years ago. We have gotten out a weekly episode every week for two years. And, you know, it's making a difference. Like we have families who are really being impacted. Um, and then I do have my biggest competition of the year in Vegas uh, for team roping that I qualified for at the South Point um, where you can go rope for, you know, really big money. It's coming up in a, about uh, about three weeks. So I've been training a lot for that. So. I'd say roping what we're doing in the financial service industry. And then our, our podcast is fun, man. Cool, man. Well, good. Yeah. yeah it's good. To, it's good to, uh, good to chat with you today. Have you any, uh, where, where do people grab your podcast? It's called family brand. Yeah. If you just go onto any of the podcast. platforms and just search family brand, the podcast will pull up. You can go to familybrand.com. We've got some cool free resources for families. Um, but yeah, man, thanks for having me on. I always love getting hang and, and chat. Yeah, man. So uh, now I know why you don't bow hunt, but uh, you know. Oh, dude, I, I see people do it, and I'm like, that looks really, really fun. And I can just imagine the rush. I've thought about that, like, because bow hunting, you got to be 30 to 40 yards at, at maximum to get that close to an animal to have to could, do that. You could, you could probably like, I hit one from 84 yards. That's long though for a bow, right? Yeah, you should like 70 is probably the max. Like this year, I passed up a 70 yard shot, and then got one at 38 but even 70 60 50 you're like you've got to be the rush of that i would imagine Dude, to the get first one close. i got was at 25 yards bro it was crazy you know it's like my dad got one at 20 yards this year 69 years old he got his first elk with a bow i was standing right next to him it was pretty special dude that's why i always say like yeah a deer that's cool whatever you get an elk with a bow it's like okay you're a man <laughs> you're like you're you're the man you know what i mean yeah the first one the first one i got though it took like so long to get it packed out it was me and one other person and oh i can like, imagine it was i was like yeah it was but that's the most adrenaline like that had ever released it was insane when i when i hit it you know 
And dude, I don't know about you, but like, there's not a lot of deer meat that I've eaten that's not a little bit gamey. Elk is like, dude, I had a buddy who is so good. You know Wayne Smith? I do. Yeah, he's he's been ingenious and stuff. So Wayne Wayne's become a great friend. But he he was like, dude, I'm gonna change your life. I'm sending you some elk meat, you know, and he put it dry froze it right, like um, dry ice or whatever. And he sent some different sausages, flavored sausages, some steaks. I was like, dude, this is some of the best meat I've ever tasted in my life. Like, my wife was in India for five weeks uh, doing this thing called Panchakarma. So I just made elk burgers every day for the kids. They just lived off of elk, basically, because that's what that's what happened when dad's in charge. You dude, know? that's awesome. South I do South have, I did, I I'll have to send it to you. It's 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 uh, the the guy said it's the most beautiful one he's ever seen as far as. But I I did shoot an axis deer. And their diet in Hawaii is oh, Hawaii. Those are, those are tasty, man. Right, dude. Those are good. That was like you couldn't have told the, to tell. You know, you couldn't. You wouldn't have been able to know that that was, you know, a yeah. deer. But yeah, and I th- also think there's this aspect of like hunting and fishing to me that can be like incredibly spiritual. You know, it doesn't. It isn't just always like, oh, I want to go out think and we're murderers as we talk about this. Just so you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm totally. Like, if, like, look. If if you're vegan, then fine. You you can make a case. If you eat meat, then you know kiss my ass like you you, you're eating meat like you can't be mad about hunting well not only that like my kids started watching the the meat eaters um documentary with steve ranella just because they were fascinated by and he's such a great storyteller but it gave them this appreciation for conservation and like my my two oldest sons started studying conservation and they were like they're like dad do you know that the reason why so many actual animals are alive today that were on the verge of extinction is because of hunting and like conservation and like there's this other part of that world that people don't really want to pay attention to or don't talk about that, like without hunting, without conservation, like there's a lot of these animals that wouldn't be where they're at today. I just like doing it, man. I don't know the positive impact. I just really enjoy it. And uh, it's like when I was I, last year, I was really stressed because I was in the middle of a comedy tour while I was hunting. And it was like when we were tracking the animals, like I wasn't thinking about that stress. I was like just totally present. You know? Yeah, it's that forced presence. It's like... Yeah powerful man well I, maybe i'll tag along someday and i'll uh, i'll witness you um I'll, I'll bow hunt from uh through through proxy or something like that uh, when i'm up at my cabin in the summer and i'm riding i'll just go take a break shoot 15 arrows come back it's like a really meditative process that way and then you know the hunt itself is pretty awesome i mean i got the one i got this year was big and it was cool because they weren't in the rut they weren't calling back we were stalking them yeah you know, Pretty have you ever done Doug Brackman's thing meditation at um what's I've he called done the meditation at mastermind talks you know the meditation at gunpoint and then yeah yeah just shoot like a, a you know like a little so I haven't done like the, I haven't done it but I, I'm fascinated that. by that but yeah he he showed me he's shooting fish with a bow now and like all this kind of stuff so he's a, he's a character it's awesome well cool man good to catch up it's been it's been a minute and uh yeah just really appreciate the work that you do and and how you show up and you know the help that you've uh, brought to my life with you know how to tell stories and how to connect and you know the origin story that we did and and uh you know definitely a difference maker so i i appreciate that yeah likewise man thanks for having me on it was fun in today's world it's easy to get distracted to get derailed to get exhausted and overwhelmed because there's so much opportunity But often those opportunities are more like distractions that destroy our bandwidth and our enjoyment. And in this chaotic world, wouldn't it be nice to cut through to the things that matter the most, to the thing that speaks to you at your core, to the life that you can love? So it's not just about creating a goal or an objective, but it's about navigating this world in a completely different way. If you're ready for radical change in a way that helps you live a better life along the way, well then check out the next video now.